Good crisp football. Football fans, it is I, Bryant. That is Alan, and this is the XFL show, and this is longtime, dear, close, personal, longtime friend of the show, Dave Naylor. Dave, welcome back. I think it's a little bit different circumstances than we thought it would be a few months ago, but here we are. How you been, man? I'm good. You know, I got to be honest. I was thinking of you guys when the news came down that the uh, that the XFL and CFL are not going to collaborate at this time. I was thinking of people I knew who would be really disappointed about this, and you two guys were top of mind. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I know how much you guys wanted to be uh, to see these two leagues get together and really invest your you know CFL XFL souls into one entity. But um, well, who knows? The road ahead may have some surprises. To me, it yeah, was the we'll possibilities, see. right? Like, yes. That's what it was, and that's what it went away. Like I love mm-hmm. the creativeness. That's what the show is. That's what we've been doing for other than five weeks of the of XFL season. We talk about what can the XFL be, and that's what this, this conversation was for so long. And I feel like that's what got taken away. I, I would agree with you, and I think from a from a CFL perspective, that's true as well. Like I think whether you were somebody who was really on board with this or not, um, you, you would recognize that the possibilities that existed with a 20 team league beyond Canadian borders, potentially. I think I probably told you guys that I think there was pretty strong designs on putting teams in Mexico in in the short order with the, the collaborative league. Um, you know, obviously that has so many more possibilities of, of what can happen than, you know, the 19 league in Canada, which a lot of people just want the 19 league in Canada. You've probably heard from a few of them. Um, they don't want to see, you know, possibilities and creativity and, and, you know, a, a different kind of future. Um, but you know pretty much what the 19 league in Canada is going to be and what it's going to look like and how it's going to operate. And the other kind of was more, if you're, if you're more the person who'd like to sort of throw your imagination and say, what if, you know, definitely the other road was a lot more intriguing, but here we are. Yeah. And you know, I, what I said, Dave, when, when it all ended was, you know, we might not be getting this alignment, but at least on this show, we did get a dear, close person, a long time, dear, good friend out of Dave Naylor, someone to talk about <laughs> alternative football leagues with and spring football leagues with. So that's that's the silver lining for me. Well, that, well, I appreciate that very much. And uh, and likewise, guys, it's like and, and to think I, that he was thinking of us, too. It's like, I, oh, absolutely, yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> I, I could tell the sincere enthusiasm you guys had, you know priming yourselves on Canadian football in anticipation of the collaborative league. Right. And, yeah, and yeah. like, what was the joke we had? Like it was the best CFL draft of uh, XFL in XFL history or something like that. Right. Back in oh, back the, the in most day. anticipated okay. CFL season so, in XFL history. In still XFL is. History, yeah. <laughs> so, so let me turn the question around to you guys right now. Where's your enthusiasm meter on the CFL 2021 season, which is now only a couple of weeks away, knowing that, and we should, we'll get to this, I'm sure on the, in the pause. That, that at least there's not an imminent collaboration. I wouldn't say like right now, and I'm not trying to stoke, yeah. you know, rumors or anything like that, but I, I would not say that this is dead, dead forever. I don't believe that. Um, but it's certainly not, you know, going to happen imminently. Where's, where, where's your enthusiasm meter on the CFL season? Where mine was at a 10, it's probably at like a nine. Cause I'm okay. still excited for the good. CFL season. Yeah. yeah. I'm still yeah following everything and i'm still gearing up for it um although this like the steelers made a, a big signing yesterday with belvin ingram so i'm also like getting in that mode too so now i'm like two brained going into football i'm still excited though for it i'm sure brian had a bigger drop than i did yeah so if i was at a 10 i'm probably dave if i'm if i'm really honest i'm probably at like a three or a four now oh, wow. just because yeah. I, I think my passion is the xfl i do love football and i did watch cfl going into the first XFL season. But now that there's all these XFL players that I recognize yeah. that are in the CFL, I think that's a lot of my excitement as well to see these players play again. To me, my excitement in the CFL are all ties to the XFL, unfortunately. And, and, and right now it's the players and that's great. But for me to like truly be passionate about something, there has to be a team that I have to be involved. In. And I right, think that's right. where if the XFL is kind of pulled out of that, I just lose a little bit of my passion. So, so the, I'm still the excited. Ed- the Edmonton Elks should be your team this year because their head coach, Jamie Elizondo, was, of course, the offensive coordinator of the Tampa Bay Vipers. So there's your legit <laughs> – we right on the there, side, right? There's a catch-22 there, though, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, 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 just because well, of their statement, they're the ones that were so vocal about oh, yes, of not they, being they, so, they did an we also joked, They did an end zone dance. We also joked that they should have changed yeah. their uh, name to the Edmonton Elk Vipers is what we yes. thought they should have yeah, changed their name to. I wrote in my column last week that, like, 
when the Elks put out their their news release about the end of the collaboration, like they might as well have put, you know, ding dong, the witch is dead right into it. Like that was, <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know that that was very well received, uh, you know, around the Canadian Football League. Yeah communication but you're right and yeah so i guess we have to do a bit of a separation of church and state in terms of you know there's the there's the business administration side of the football team which was clearly against anything to do with the xfl and they didn't leave any doubt and then on the football side you know i'm, I'm gonna assume jamie elizondo isn't an anti-xfl guy well i don't know what he would have thought of collaboration but he certainly has you know strong xfl ties and and was it like i believe he took over the play calling yes. right right before everything shut down that Tressman. Yeah. Tressman was calling plays, and then he delegated mm. that to Elizondo, and I think the Vipers' offense uh, got a bit of a kick from that as well. Oh, the last game of the season, I was there. The Vipers against the Wildcats it was the most offensive game, you know, offensive output game in in the in the league, and it was the last. Yeah, one. they were very productive. <laughs> well, yes, see, the Vipers. Jamie Elizondo is a true North American, a guy who's you know coaching and lived like a lot of his life in Canada for football, you know. Uh, Raised in, I believe, El Paso, Texas, you know, coached in U.S. college, but he's born in Mexico. So he's um, a true North American. And it would have been perfect for what the alignment he, might have been, have or at least was rumored to be. North American yeah. International League, exactly. <laughs> he would have been the poster boy. But mm-hmm. so let, let's get it. Let's get into it, Dave. Then the the ultimate end of these alignment talks, what do you attribute them to? Is it the reluctance of teams like the Edmonton Elks or was it just too complicated all around? Um, like most matters on this, I'm going to give you guys my opinion, some of which is based on facts and some of which is based on me kind of filling in the blanks on on some things that we don't yet know. Um, I think there was a time element to this. From what I understand, at the time that they went public with the talks, they wanted to have a decision to go public with by July the 15th, which would have you know given them get it out of the way from the start of the CFL season. Um, I think the XFL People got a little bit tired of waiting anything beyond that. I don't think the CFL felt like they were ready to make a decision on this. And if you can't make a decision and go forward comfortably, then you probably got to, you know, hit the pause. Different ways to interpret their news release. Did they hit the pause button on this or did they hit the, you know, we're done button with this? Um, You know, I I tend to think there's probably opinions of both within the CFL. (laughs) There are probably some people that think we're done with this. And there are probably some people, I, I know there's some people who don't, who think they're, they're not. Um, and I, I think, I think there's a real difficulty in merging a league that is in existence with a league that is in theory. If this, if the XFL was up and playing, I think it would have been a lot easier to sort of practically put this together. And the fact that it wasn't, I think made a lot, left a lot to the imagination. And a lot of times when you're asked, being asked to take a leap, a leap of this kind, you know, kind of trust us, it'll all work out is, is a hard, can be a hard sell. And, and that, and I don't mean that that, that they were, you know, being, uncooperative but it's just there were just things you couldn't answer because the xfl isn't up and running right so that's that and i and i think on the on the business side from what i understand there was sort of a a football side of this and a business side of that that were going to kind of be separate that the the business side would have required the teams in canada to give up a lot of control and and here culturally that's a really tricky thing and and i'll use the nfl as an example right now in this, in the in the NFL, the league runs runs things, and the teams follow in step, right? And and in out of their appreciation of of the teams following in step, every team gets a check for I think I read the other day three hundred eight million dollars a year. Like I would stand in step for three hundred eight million dollars a year too, right? In the CFL, it's the opposite. Most of the revenue is derived locally. The percentage of revenue you get from the league office, you know, is is much much smaller than it would be for an NFL team on a percentage basis. Um, you know, for some teams, it might be as small as ten percent of their revenue is actually coming from the league office. You know, that range. So, it tends to be a, a a league where the leagues run things. So when you talk, or sorry, where the teams run things, and the league kind of acts at the whims of the of the teams. Uh, what t- tail wagging dog, you might say, is is the sort of the way the CFL has always operated. So when you're talking about the teams giving up that kind of control in a new league, that's a real aggressive cultural shift for the teams to accept that, right? Okay, this is how our league's going to operate, and this is where the decision making is going to come from, and we're all going to walk in step on that. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I think that was part of it, and ultimately, I think there was there were teams that looked at the edge over the edge and couldn't, you know, rationalize some of the things that they were going to have to do 
which inevitably, which was, you know, changing rules, changing seasons, changing Canadian quotas, all those things, none of which I believe they ever got to. Like for all those stories, sometimes rumors came out, oh, I've heard they've lowered the ratio to two or, you know, they're going with uh, six downs or whatever. I'm making that up. But you know what I mean? There were a lot of things about four downs and all this stuff. I don't believe they ever got to that. And I think also one of the breakdowns was how quickly they needed to get to that. Like I think there were some differences of opinions of before we announce a collaborative league, don't we have to have all that stuff worked out? Or can we really announce a collaborative league and say, and we'll work out those things down the road? I think there were some difference of opinions on that. So ultimately, yeah, they couldn't really agree on the timing. They couldn't really agree on what need, what the priorities that needed to be sorted out before they, they went down this road. Um, and I think there was probably some sense in the CFL of wanting to not have this hanging over their return season in 2021. Uh, so ultimately, I think that's that's where it went. I don't I don't think there's bitter feelings between the XFL and the CFL people. I think there are some bitter feelings around the CFL Board of Governors table. I'm not sure that they're all singing kumbaya over this. <laughs> um, so, you know, we'll see. But that's that's where I think it all kind of and, and, and I think there's a lot of momentum on this one early on. And you guys, when you had me on early in the show, I would have told you, like, I thought there was a very strong probability. And we started, I never, I really haven't had sources on this story that have given me great details of what's gone on, but I have had sources that have kind of told me which way the wind is blowing or how hard it's blowing, if you know what I mean. And, and I think there was a sense that the momentum on this was slowing and, you know, somebody had handicapped it to me and said, you know, I would have said 75% back in, when this was announced in March the 10th, now I think it's more like 50%. And so there was, we all had a sense that this was, you know, going another way. The other thing is the CFL may have been a little bit more emboldened on its ability to make it by the single game betting legislation. Now, I don't know if this is realistic or not. I've done my homework and research and talked to people in the betting and try to get a sense of what actually this is going to mean to the bottom line of CFL teams. Cause there are certainly teams that are hoping that this is a game changer and maybe if the single game betting thing wasn't out there, the league would have been, you know, a little more, uh, shall we say, incentivized to 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 collaborate with the XFL, and because it was more worried about its own business model. You could certainly make the argument that, hey, if we are going into a legal betting environment, a twenty team league is a lot more appealing than a nine team league. So that should be an incentive for us to do a deal with the XFL, because we know serious betters are going to be turned off by a four game slate. A lot of them are. Um, so, it, it, but I think ultimately the the legalization of single game betting in Canada probably emboldened the CFL a little more to do things on its own. Um, so those those I think some of the you know those are all the factors I think that that went into it. Um, and and look, it, there's no question it would have been enormous risk, right? Uh, changing undoubtedly changing the time of your season, changing your game, and basically it was the ultimate kind of okay, we know we're going to piss people off if we do this, but are we going to attract more long-term if we do this? And that, that was the equation always. And ultimately, I, I don't just think they, the, the CFL people were not convinced of the business case, right? That's what they absolutely had to be. And, and I, I don't know whether when the XFL gets going now towards 2023, and we'll see what kind of shape the CFL is in at the end of 2021. I think there's still going to be some pretty harsh financial realities waiting for this league at the end of this season. Does that regenerate those conversations? You know, I, I certainly think it could. I, I don't, I, I would never say there's a probability that they get together and there's a collaborative league. I, I don't believe that. But could I say it is an impossibility? No, I wouldn't say that either. You know, Dave, and I know you're kind of speaking more direct than anything else, but to me, the XFL obviously came in with a, with probably big plans, and, and and they're learning from what they're trying to do. And th this is all new ownership that's never done this before, so we can't really give them the credit of 2020 because there's only so many people. But on the CFL side, when you say things like, did single-game betting deter them from doing this? Or what are they going to do at the end of 2021? Like Those are questions to me, and I'm just a fan, that if you don't know or anticipate or, or have – a feeling of what you're going to do, then there's other problems with your league that that you need to address, right? Because those are things that you have to foresee. Like I made a joke that do you think Randy Ambrosi was one morning be like, oh, what's this thing about CFL single game betting? Like what what's 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 this Canada? Like did that happen? Because to me, I think the CFL has to at least take something from this and learn on how to move forward. Because if they're not anticipating these types of things, 
then there might only be one league playing in 2023, and it's not going to be the CFL. Well, I mean, if you guys want to play, like, bad scenario for the Canadian Football League, I can do it. You ready? <laughs> I just want this. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do a Cue little positive Armageddon because I do, I, I'm totally with this, David. I'm just trying to say that if the CFL didn't learn from something from this and that they have to change what they're doing and how they anticipate things, where are we with the CFL? Here is the biggest challenge facing the Canadian Football League, okay? Before the pandemic, this league in its three biggest markets, Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto, one third of its league. And if you do it population wise, fan, you know, potential fan base, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a lot more than one third of the league. It's probably two thirds of the country in terms of population in those cities and compared to the other six markets. In those three markets, their business, their plan for survival over the last 25 years has been count on an owner who doesn't mind losing money to enjoy being the owner of a professional football team. That's been the plan. Okay. I don't, I don't know that the Montreal Alouettes have ever made money since they came back to the league in 1996. Like Bob Wetnall, who owned that team, owned that team the way some rich guys own their yachts. Cost me 5 million a year, but I love it. It's my yacht. Doesn't make money. Just that's what I spend my money on because I love it. That's how Bob Wetnall ran the Montreal Alouettes. You know, I, he was, he's an independently wealthy guy, loves professional football. I'm sure he would have liked to make money, but I don't think he did very often, if at all. Um, David Braley in BC, kind of the same, but not quite. I mean, Braley, I think, was a very shrewd um, at the Board of Governors table, you know, behind the scenes. There's a reason that there seem to be a lot of Grey Cups in Vancouver and Toronto when he owned the Argonauts and Grey Cups. And you talk about the CFL business model. The one thing that does work is Grey Cups. You know, they make a lot of money. So if you've if you're getting you know, if you're getting a great cup every three or four years, as Braley seemed to over those years, that's that's a lot of, you're probably making $10 million on every one of them, and that makes it a lot easier to fund your team. In Montreal and in Toronto, you have, you know, the, the country's largest, biggest, richest sports entertainment company uh, that uh, that owns the Toronto Argonauts. And, and even their losses are, you know, a fraction of what they make on the Raptors, on the Leafs, and not so much make money, year over year on Toronto FC, but it's a, they bought, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment bought Toronto FC 12, 13 years ago for $10 million. That league's now hatching expansion franchises for 350 US. So the equity play with Toronto FC has been pretty good. Um, so, but, you know, all, obviously that company with the, what's happened in the NHL and the NBA doesn't, doesn't have the, the cash flow that it did or the last year and a half haven't. And maybe those losses for the Toronto Argonauts, you know, aren't as palatable. Throw in the fact that we know the Argos were the most bullish team on the XFL. Okay. We know Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment was all in on this. Okay. Uh, there, the guy in Montreal who bought the team came in at the urging and assurance of Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment people. Okay, so we got two teams that have historically lost money, both of which we believe were very big on the XFL. Then you go down to Vancouver, where the team is owned by an estate. Okay, so here's the thing. In order to make the Canadian Football League function, you need one of two things. You need owners in those three cities that are willing to lose money and fund those teams in perpetuity, or you need a business model in those markets that works. The league does not have a business model that works in those markets. Therefore, you need committed philanthropists to keep those teams going. Do we have committed philanthropists in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver beyond the 2021 season? That is the question that will dictate the future of the Canadian Football League and how crisis driven it may or may not be. That is the question. That's yeah, not that's, that's a, not a spot to be in when you just had an opportunity <laughs> with the XFL. But I understand it, and we'll see if that's what they do moving forward. I mean, that's almost – I mean, especially for a CFL fan, that's the most interesting and important thing you could keep an eye on uh, outside of the football field. For an XFL fan, we sit here and say, what a, what a bunch of bozos. They just missed a golden opportunity potentially. But also looking at the CFL, Dave, now – since we don't fully know the the or the XFL, excuse me, the XFL's plan, we don't fully know it. Can we say that they whiffed on these alignment talks as well, Did, or uh, is the the rollout of their league, you know, still you think in an okay spot 
to return in 2023 since it is it's still two years out or a little bit less than two years out and we don't know a whole lot as opposed to the CFL we see we it's obvious to anybody who pays attention they're not in a good spot coming out of the alignment talks still with their business model the XFL it's more mysterious so therefore who knows but what do you think of the XFL coming out of alignment talks you know I it's, it's really tough to to sort of answer the question directly just because we don't know the specifics of yeah I know it a little bit sort of what it looked like from the CFL side of things but like looking at it from what the XFL people were looking at across the table I really don't have a good idea of what they said yes or no to you know in terms of that um, but I, I'll tell you one of the interesting questions that came out of the end of it from the XFL's perspective was them putting out the release that mentioned, you know, we're going to go forward and build an international football league. Because as you guys know, I have, I, I highlighted that in the original, in the original communication, like where Danny Garcia went on and put the, the American flag, the Canadian flag and the globe. Right. And I had a source in the league, in our league that told me, Oh, if this happens, we're going to, I think we're going to have teams in Mexico within like a few years, right? That's part of the vision here. And then you start looking at Randy Ambrosi's international vision and say, would that be easier to execute with a 19 league in Canada or with a 22 team league with 11 franchises in the U.S. and two in Mexico? Well, it certainly would, right? And even if you look at the some of the potential uh, of alignment with Europe as well, right? And all of that kind of. So the intriguing thing for me is, is the XFL going to basically take you know take that? And say because because the release did specifically mention that right so okay we know the mexico idea that makes sense then you go to the idea of well would they put teams in canada right there's nothing stopping them from doing it um and and you guys have probably seen you know speculation that has been out there dan ralph and canadian press wrote a story saying you know could the argos up and and go to the xfl um i don't think that would happen but um, you know, I, I, I put, I put it one tweet on it. I said, you know, I believe the speculation about the Argos to the XFL is derived from the fact that MLSE was known to be the most bullish on the XFL collaboration. Would they go it alone? I have no idea. Certainly nobody has suggested to me that's their plan. Uh, I think it, I think it is purely speculation driven, Yeah. but, yeah. but I mean, like, the XFL could say, Hey, we want to we want to be an international league. We're going to put two teams in Mexico, and we're going to put one in Toronto. And we're going to put one in Vancouver. You know, and there's I don't think there's anything that would stop them. No, and no, and and you could you know whether they wanted to be league owned franchises or search for franchisees. So that's you know that's the interesting thing to me is where does the XFL go now, right? And and does the USFL play into this at all? But I, I think I think that every alternative football league has to have something that kind of identifies it or defines it differentiates it from the rest right and when it was the alliance of american football it was we're going to play geographically close to where guys played college because we want to take advantage of that and which which made sense to me right that's that's a huge bit of equity that i'd rather have a guy from texas a&m playing in dallas than playing you know in new york sort of thing like that that whole idea yeah, the original USFL had a similar and the structure XFL too, as well. Yeah, and the original yeah, XFL. It makes yeah. sense. It makes sense. The X and the XFL, of course, has had its you know funky rules, right? And it's kind of and that that have, have been sort of we're going to be more creative and more innovative. It was a little more brash the first time around. Turned down the volume a little bit on the second one, but there was still this you know curiosity of of a game that's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little more fast moving. It's going to be a little more fan friendly, and so. But now you look at it and say, okay, we've got another alternative league coming supposedly in the USFL. We've got the XFL that's going to be coming around for three for its third go around, which I don't think is really fair because the first, the second one obviously ended in unnatural circumstances. But there'll be a lot of people that are just going to say, hasn't this league been around twice? So what's going to define it? And it seems to me like what may define it is the international vision, which you know, was would have lined up pretty strongly with where the CFL wanted us to go. That was one of the areas where they really seemed to have a shared vision at least you know among some areas so you know it, w did the xfl blow it by not doing a collaboration with the cfl i guess it all depends on where they go for the next two it's really a question we're only going to be able to answer in retrospect I yeah think. and that's yeah. the question is if they did this right let's say the xfl goes and says um let's just have real fun here with blue sky okay we're going to put two teams in canada we're going to put two teams in mexico 
and we've got 10 of our own. We're going to have a 14-team league next year. You know, could you see the CFL say, you know, again, once the, once the XFL is a tangible league that really exists, and once it does have those franchises, could you see the CFL say, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe we want to get on board with this now. And we it's maybe like, we don't like want everyone but Edmonton. If, yeah, if, yeah, everyone but <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it would be it would be interesting to see, right? And I, and like I assume that's how this XFL CFL thing started. I think was originally their interest in markets like Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, and then you know the CFL getting wind of that and saying, well, why don't we talk about the whole? I think that's probably how this started. And there's certainly been versions of that, you know, suggested to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know. I it, it'll. If, if the I guess the question is, does the XFL have a Canada strategy aside from the CFL? That is an intriguing question, yeah. my friends. Yeah, and and that question. may you know question. help sort of flush out your answer of did the XFL blow it or not on the CFL thing? Um, well, we'll see where they go. Yeah. I, also, I well, don't you, think the XFL lost any like cachet or momentum no. because they really didn't have too much going into it. No. And no. Yeah. So it's just more. It's just still. A, a, a yeah. league in theory, and everybody has to just keep an eye on it. Right. And I assume most U.S. that this was not as big a story in the U.S. as no. it was in Canada, of course. Yeah. And so by the time they launch in 2023, the average football fan may have some vague memory that they had a conversation with the Canadian Football League, but it's not this you know turning point in the road that it is for the three of us, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> and so me and Alan have talked about this, and you brought it up, uh, Dave, is that the Argos – are rumored, right? This is all this rumor about, hey, maybe the Argos want to go. What's going on there? Right. I kind of debunked it and said, well, the XFL is not going to buy the Argos, right? They're like That's out of the question because they could just put a team there for a lot cheaper. Sure. Unless MLSC says, hey, XFL, manage our team. I don't see it happening. So that brings in, hey, if the XFL puts a team in Toronto and then maybe in Vancouver, like you're saying, and all of a sudden these teams start making money, those owners in those cities are going to be like, look, it's possible. Why aren't we doing it? And I think that brings in a lot of different questions. And one could be, hey, Argos, are you going to be in the XFL? Dave, is it even possible for that to even happen? Because if the CFL loses, is the CFL a league without Toronto, even though Toronto loses money? Well, and and I, I, before I answer this question, I should declare up front, okay, I work for TSN, which is owned by Bell Media which owns, I think, 37% of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, which owns the Argos, okay? So just all potential conflicts laid out there all, all the way. All, and, you know, and that said, and like, I honestly, uh, I, I do not have a direct line to, you know, the people at, at Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment that are, that some of the, you know, I, and the reason I say that is that when some of the stuff on the XFL, when I was quite bullish on the league's, you know, opportunity and suggesting they should, people were saying, well, you're just saying what MLSE tells you to say. like. That is not, uh, it, you know, that's not true. I'll just say that, but I, bluntly, that is not true. I don't take my orders from MLSC. And I really, in a practical sense, I have no more relationship with them than I do with any other owner in the Canadian football league. It, it, it's just the fact that, but I just wanted to declare that relationship behind. Appreciate the there. transparency. So look, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment is a company that is, and this is one of the challenges of the CFL, right? The the as much as the healthiest franchises in the CFL are the are the publicly owned teams. The publicly owned teams are not necessarily profit driven, or like they don't care about franchise value, right? They they care about sustainability and building good organizations, but the perspective may be you know a little bit different, including the fact that people who run them don't have their own money in them, which also can change their perspective on something. Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment is a privately owned, or well, ultimately. It's Bell, Rogers, and Larry Tannenbaum, right? And their shareholders, certainly on the Bell and Rogers end. But the company's mission is to create value and profit and equity. So they've done it in real estate. They've done it in hockey. They've done it in basketball. They've done it in soccer. And they are you know, wildly, wildly successful in all of those ventures. In, in the Argonauts, I think Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment believe that moving the team to BMO Field that they may not make a lot of money on that on the team, but they could probably cut the losses to a very manageable degree for a company of their size. There's probably some public good in you know helping the Argonauts you know uh, that needed an owner at that time. Um, 
you know, would that have created some favor if there's ever an opportunity for a National Football League team at some point that you were good soldiers with the Argos, uh, even though MLSE itself couldn't own a team, right? Because you can't have a corporation own a team, but you could have people certainly, you know, close to that franchise, Larry Tannenbaum being the most obvious involved in that. Um, and, um, you know, we'll try and create some value here. And, and so what has their experience been with the Argos? Massive losses, like significant losses of, you know, I would think in the, $10 million a year range, probably. I think Dan Ralph reported 12 in his story, I believe. So let's conservatively, you know, say 10. Um, and the needle is not moving in Toronto. Like, the, it's not like, well, we can see it coming. Like, it's not. It's been flat. And part of that is they've been horrendous on the field for three of the four years that they've been at BMO Field. Like, you know, I think they're 22 and 50 since they moved to BMO Field. I looked up, I figured this the other day. So, you know, it's not been entertaining football. It's not been winning football, but the needle hasn't moved. And so if you were Maple Leaf Sports and Rate Entertainment right now, and you objectively looked at this and said, what do we have in a CFL franchise in Toronto? There are not great indications that this is about to evolve into something that you're going to make money on or create value of. So you and you would look and say, okay, well, if we're not going to create, make money or create value off of this, how might we create value or money and make money off of football. Well, we can't have a national football league team, uh, at least, you know, here and now. So what about this other entity? Can we make money and create value off this entity? And that would come down to what you believe in about Danny Garcia and Dwayne Johnson and Redbird Capital. And if you believe that they have a vision to create value and make money off of alternative professional football, you certainly might say, I'd rather put my lot with them than with these guys. Because we own a franchise that, quite frankly, I don't think has made a nickel since 1990. Like, I don't think the Toronto Argonauts have made money since Harry Ornest owned them and they moved into the Rogers Center, then Skydome in 1989. I think the last, the last time somebody made money on the Toronto Argonauts. So unless you see that changing, it doesn't really fit the mission of what Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment is about. Right? They're not about cultural preservation. They're not about charity. They're not about uh, philanthropy. They're about profit and value and re driving revenue. Yeah. So, so you basically look at it and say, who do we think we have a better chance to do that with? These guys or these guys? And that's ultimately, or, and now that that's, obviously when Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment looked at that as a potential collaboration, they firmly believed they had a better chance to make money and create value going with the XFL than they did staying as a nine-team CFL. So they didn't get their way. The league stayed as a nine-team league. What is what does MLSE do next? Do they stay the course, and, or do they say we don't want to do this anymore at all? Or do they say, hey, you know, if the XFL is playing in twenty twenty three, we might want to do that? Like, I, I don't know. This is a completely speculative conversation, but I would stamp out ridiculous speculation if I heard it, and I don't think it's you know completely ridiculous speculation. No, educate me a little bit, Dave, because I don't I don't know the answer to this. Is it? Is it the Argos fault or is it the CFL's fault that they're not making money? Like what I mean by that is like, whose eyes is it? Like, is it the CFL's like, Hey, you need to figure out how to make money. Good luck. Or is it the Argos saying, or is it MLSC saying, Hey league, we need to figure out how to all make money. You know, it's, 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 um, boy, I, we could do a whole podcast on the Toronto Argonauts of the last 30 years. And cause it, cause as an outsider, and I've said this to many people, like who've come in and seen the Argonaut situation, like, I don't get this. And I say, it doesn't make any sense to an outsider, does it? No, you have a 140 year old franchise, like whose people's parents and grandparents, like were season tickets of in a sport that has no competition, in a city has no competition for football. There's no high level college football in the city, right? There's, in fact, the college football teams that there are in the city are historically awful, right? There's, there's an NFL team in Buffalo, um, but there's not one here. And, and the, the professional franchise that has, you know, a, a, a huge legacy. I mean, one of the, it, it is, is been basically, you know, abandoned by a generation. It doesn't make any sense to the outsiders. Um, and people can say to me, well, look at the demographics of Toronto. Half of the country was, half the city was born in another country and things like, yeah, yeah, okay. But like, look who's actually playing football in Canada. It's their kids. Like football is a massive first generation Canadian game. Massive. And, and I, even look at the Canadians that have gone to the NFL or playing a major college football. A lot of them, their families are new to Canada. So it's not, you know, um, it's, it's not that immigrants or the new Canadians have not gravitated to football. They have. They just haven't gravitated to the CFL as fans. 
So it is it is a fascinating conundrum. And if I told you guys the number of nights I have lost to sleep just staring at the ceiling trying to figure this thing out, um, it, it's it's very, very tricky. And see, I'm 53. So I am right on the edge of the last generation of, of young people who grew up in Toronto, and I'm from Toronto, or the suburbs, that grew up watching the Toronto Argonauts as a mainstream thing. Right. I was 16 in 1983 when the Argos ended their 35 year Grey Cup drought or whatever it was and beat the BC Lions. Okay. I remember going to my locker in high school and at three o'clock at the end of the Friday before the Grey Cup weekend and somebody shouted Argos in the high school and the whole high school, 2,500 kids just started shouting Argos, 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 Argos. And it was just like going through the halls and people burst out the doors and they were so excited for the Grey Cup on Sunday. I work with people at TSN that went to the same high school as me like 10 years later. When I tell them that story, they make it sound like men from Mars landed at, at, at Thornley Secondary School. Like they just can't imagine that, right? It changed so quickly. And what happened is the Argos won the Grey Cup in 83. That 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 burst a balloon sort of, of, of like the, it was like that story, the team that could never win a championship in a 19 league, right? They finally did. And there are people this day that can name that roster like crazy, but haven't watched an Argo game since. The very next year, in 1984, the Blue Jays got in their first pennant race okay, with the Tigers. That was the year the Tigers went 35-5. and five. The Jays chased them till you know, it's kind of September. And then in 85, the Jays win the AL East. And so at the same time, the Argonauts have kind of burst their balloon and the CFL is kind of being outdated in some of its business practices – the Blue Jays all of a sudden are being talked about in New York, in Boston, on ABC, on ESP, like that. And that gets everybody in Toronto's attention, right? All of a sudden playing the Saskatchewan Rough Riders yeah, doesn't excite us as much, right? Because we're, we're, they're talking about us on WFAN in New York, right? That's, so that's where the kind of crossroads comes, okay? Throw into that the fact that you have an explosion of exposure from the national football league, right? Like you think of what NFL games were in the seventies and eighties, they were on and CFL games were on, but we didn't have, you know, an entire network of, of nothing but NFL programming. We didn't have all day pregame shows. We didn't have all the, the, the fantasy and the, and those things that have all fl- uh, sprung up around the NFL. So that's what happens in Southern Ontario and in Toronto in particular, like, is a bit of a snobby city, right? It's a bit of a wannabe city. And it's a bit of a, we want to be like New York. We want to be like Chicago. We want to be quote unquote world-class. And we don't think the Canadian football league is world-class. And you've got a generation of people who've grown up not seeing the CFL as an alternative professional league with a proud history, but as minor league football. Like that's the way a typical 20 year old would, would see the Canadian football league. And they've also seen, you know, some of the stories that the league has been involved in, like bankruptcies and owners walking away from teams and those kind of things and going, that doesn't really, you know, other leagues don't do that. Right. That's, that's not, that, that, that tells me this isn't like big time sport. If you've got franchises that are in trouble or things like that. So you've got some of that collateral damage as well. So that's the long answer to your question. Whose fault is it? I, look, I am, I think that is that operating a Canadian football league team in Toronto is really challenging. Okay. And, and I, and there are people who tell you that you, if you just do it right, you can make it work. Well, how many owners have we had since 1990? Okay. We had Harry Ornest, we had Gretzky, McDonald and Candy. We had Interbrew. We had Sherwood Schwartz. We had David Cinnamon and Howard Sokolowski. We had David Braley, who owned the BC Lions at the same time, right? And the reason they had him owning two teams wasn't because they thought that was a great idea. It was because they couldn't find somebody to own the Argos at that time and Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. So seven owners, okay? Maybe they're all idiots. Don't think so, right? Maybe they all haven't tried the best ideas. I agree. agree. But I think that speaks to what a challenge the Toronto Argonauts have been. So I don't think it's just ownership. Um, I think it's more the league and the brand and that once you lose momentum as a, as an entertainment and sports property, it's hard to reverse it, you know, and the, the league has a challenge in general at with the demographics, right? The typical stereotype of a CFL t- fan is me, like a 53 year old white guy, right? That That's who people think of as a typical CFL fan. Um, they, they have a real gem- demographic challenge right across this country, but particularly in the big cities and particularly in Toronto. 
So that's that's a long-winded answer on Toronto. But we could do oh yeah, we could do a podcast just on on Toronto. The most you know, I I, I joke sometimes. I said you know, football is the most popular sport in North America, but in Toronto, college football domestically doesn't draw. They had a bowl game here for like four years. It died. The Bills in Toronto series was a catastrophe. Like. <laughs> It's a money sport everywhere in the world, except here. Every football venture in Toronto of the last like thirty years basically has has failed and lost money. And that, that's that brings me to my next question perfectly, Dave, because you gave us this awesome history of the Toronto Argonauts. They have uh, over a hundred years of history, a sort of I mean I would call it prestige, a legacy, uh, you know, franchise. But then thirty years, tumultuous thirty years. So if you talk about this rumor in the XFL gaining the Argonauts, is that an actual victory for the XFL to steal a team away from the from another league like the CFL? Or is it a better idea just to start fresh with a new franchise in the city where football seems to be doomed of Toronto? It's funny, you know, I just I just read a there's a book coming out called I think I'll get the title wrong, like The Year of the Rocket or whatever. It's about the nineteen ninety one Toronto Argonauts, Paul Woods wrote it it's it's really really interesting and I, I blurred the back of it so i got to read it on pdf before it's actually come out and one of the things a few things in there that i've forgotten one of them was that gretzky mcnall and candy bought the toronto argonauts in 1990 or 1991 for five million dollars now you think of what most franchise values have done in the last 30 years right toronto argonauts aren't worth five million dollars today like that's, that was just like a wow, you know, like they were worth $5 million in 1990, 1991, right? And most, most sports properties that were worth $5 million in 1990 or 1991 are today worth whatever, you know, we did the, we talked about Toronto FC over the last dozen years, right? Just the up value up 40 times. Argonauts have been the opposite. Um, yeah, I, that, that would be, a, so would it be a feather in their cap to steal the Toronto Argonauts or the Toronto Argonauts or should they do their own team? Oh boy. I guess it all believe it all comes down to what you believe the, the value of the Toronto Argonaut brand is, right? Because what you're talking about is if you, if a Toronto team was going to be in the XFL, what you're really talking about is what should their uniforms look like and what should they be called? Mm -hmm. Right? So what's the value of the Toronto Argonaut name and that brand right now? Um, you know, it has a lot of meaning to people, of a certain age and not so much to people as, as a younger age. So I would, I would say, I don't know that necessarily you would need to, you certainly wouldn't need to take the Toronto Argonauts, you know, to make this successful. You could probably do it with a, with a, you know, a differentiated product. If, especially if your demographic that you're trying to go after is, you know, under 35, that's what I would, that's what I would say. So I don't, I don't think you necessarily need to take the Toronto Argonauts, you know, to make, now, you know, there was, you guys may know that, you know, there was an arena league team in the city for a while, right? at all the toronto <laughs> phantoms oh good name of, i like it i'm about look them up like 2002 2003 somewhere in there um they were owned i believe by rogers the same people that own the blue jays uh not a glorious uh, existence for the toronto <laughs> phantoms no. so like that's another throw that into the lot the uh the you know the waste bin of toronto football ventures uh the, there's the toronto phantoms as well yeah um, I just go with Toronto. I just start fresh. Go Toronto Drakes and, and make that a, yeah. make that the collab, and yeah, it'll be good. That's that's uh, <laughs> that probably would be popular with some. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you know, Dave, I, I thank you for coming on. We it's been about a week and a half. We're kind of like hesitating. Like, do we do it right now? Right when it's announced, let's let this yeah. marinate for a little bit. So it's kind of good that everything's yeah. I think kind it was of good behind us now. Yeah, because. So much has been speculated. So much has been talked about. So I'm glad we got this conversation. So thank you. I will end on this, and I'll ask you this question. Uh, we, we've alluded to it a little bit here. When the announcement came out, it was at this time. What does that truly mean? And from all accounts, and maybe I'm wrong, and I could be biased because I'm an XFL guy, it does seem like, hey, in the future, if this happens, it's going to be a, hey, XFL, do you want to do this again type thing? Like, is that how you see this happening at some point if it's reconsidered in the future? Well, I, I think, and the league doesn't want to admit this, but I think its interest in the XFL was largely crisis driven, right? Or the, and the ability and the, there are people in the league that think this league has just lurched from one crisis to another, to another, to another, which it kind of has, you know, for the last 30 years. And they saw this deeper crisis as an opportunity 
to get out of just resuming a regular series of crises. Okay. And the question, I guess, is if it was, if it was crisis that brought the league to the XFL, you know, would, will it take another crisis to bring them back to that? And I think that's probably true. Like, I think there's enough, there's enough and, and totally legitimate reasons. Like as much as I was bullish on the XFL opportunity, I was not so much bullish on like pulling the trigger on it as just finding out what it is. Like it's, you know, I, I that's, you're not going to lose anything by doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the question is, you know, I, I think there is, there are lots of reasons not to do this. Like tradition, you know, the, how much you value Canadian players, the rules. All, I, I don't want to sound like that stuff doesn't mean something to me. It does. It means a lot to me, but not to the point that I would rather see the league fold and die as a three down league with Canadian players than adapt and play something else. Like there were people who said, like people in the media who said flat out, I would rather see this league die, you know, with three downs and 21 Canadians a team than adapt. That's not me. Okay. So if they do run into a series of crises, and we talked about some of the dynamics that could lead to that, and they have to go back to the XFL, then like that's reality. You know, that's that's just adaptation and moving on. I, I, I that's I'm okay with that. I'm not necessarily cheering for that, but if it happened, you know that that is I think what would could ultimately that's what brought them to the XFL in the first place, and I think that's what could could bring them back. And and maybe if there's a more tangible vision of what the XFL is actually doing. Um, and I think there was some frustration on the CFL side of that. We don't even know what that is. You know, we're not really sure what it is. They, you know, how do we, how do we, they, I'm not sure they know what they want. I, you know, I heard things like that. So maybe once the XFL does know what they want and you can actually tangibly look at what this thing is and evaluate it, um, you know, maybe that becomes an easier to bridge for the Canadian Football League to cross down the road. But I think it's going to have to take a crisis to get them there. But there are some scenarios where the, this league could very much you know, be back in, in crisis mode. And, and, you know, the, some of the questions around the major markets that we talked about are, are going to be the things and that, that bugs people on the prairies, you know, like, Hey, we're supporting our team in Saskatchewan and Winnipeg and Edmonton. Why do we have to adapt just because a bunch of people in Toronto don't get the CFL completely legitimate, but unless you can run a six team league, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Too bad. That's just that, that. You know, that's that's the reality of what of what what's being done here. So, I don't know. I'm I'm really intrigued. I think given the environment we're in, what we've come through, the state of the Canadian Football League, and some of the questions that are unanswered about its future, I I'm really don't know for sure where this league is going to be in two or three years. You know, and I haven't said that for a long time. We've been through a, you know, as much as I say the league has been sort of crisis driven, you know, off and on, even over all the last thirty years the last 10 or 12 have been a relative period of stability for the CFL, right? Like they had an Ottawa franchise fold in 06, 05, 06. You know, Toronto, they had a mini crisis. They managed to avert by letting Braley own both teams. Montreal, they had a crisis that they kept relatively quiet. You know, the other eight teams stepped in and paid the bills, but it wasn't, the story all year wasn't franchise on fire. You know, it was franchise for sale. So they've, they've been able to sort of minimize the damage at least you know, image and, and business wise on the rest of the league by these, by these crises. Um, but if you ever get more than one, like the CFL can handle basically one crisis at a time in a 19 league. If you ever get more than one, um, I'll end on this note. Just as it's kind of interesting. 25 years ago, the great cup was last played in Hamilton, right? That was one year. That was the first season after the collapse of us expansion. And CFL retrenches in 1996 as a nine-team league. Baltimore moves to Montreal, and they are they're a nine-team Canadian league. Uh, in that Great Cup in Hamilton, three teams were in bankruptcy: Ottawa, Montreal, and BC. Ottawa folded. Montreal and BC got new owners, each of which stayed with them until the last couple of years. Right? Uh, Bob Wetnall and David Braley. But the conversation that week in Great Cup week was about the CFL's true existential crisis. I like, is this the last Grey Cup? That was a legit conversation in 1996. Interestingly, guess where we're back this year for the first time? (laughs) Hamilton. (laughs) And they're having the first Grey Cup of the post-pandemic, you know, going down the road without the XFL with some serious questions hanging over some of these franchises. So I've I've pointed out the symmetry to a few people (laughs) and they've said, wow. So Hopefully, we're not having a conversation in Grey Cup week about is this the last Grey Cup? Hopefully, it's not that deep an existential crisis. But I do think there's there's kind of an interesting symmetry for where this season is going to end. 
And the and even that great cup, even though it was played in November, was played in a blizzard. If you look up the photos, you know, go on Google Image and check out 1996 great cup. It's a, it's a Doug Flutie led Toronto Argonaut team that beat Edmonton. But the pictures are spectacular because it's in a blizzard. And this year we know the great cup in Hamilton is like the latest has ever been December 12th. So we might even get back to, you know, the blizzard to uh, it's, you know, tw- a quarter of a century later, later, we're all back in the same place. That's freaky. And I, and I, I feel for the people of Hamilton because I don't know if this, the, it, they'll ever have one again, even if there are more great cups, I don't know if you want to have the great cup there, but I I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the future for the CFL coming out of this. My hope is I, I I'm, I don't feel like the alignment talks with the XFL will pick back up. My hope for the CFL, Dave, as a fan, is they just take knowledge gained from the talks with the XFL and change the business model and get to something more sustainable. It's kind of madness, like you said, for an outsider to see a team like Toronto uh, and and see how you have teams that are saying, oh, who cares if you don't make money? And then you got it's, – it's different ownerships – it's really bizarre, but I hope something changes business wise for the CFL because I want to see it be sustainable. Because this, it, you don't want this to happen every twenty five years. <laughs> no, no, great game, tough business. Yes, that has been the CFL's. That has been the CFL's legacy, and and sometimes, like I say, you, you really do have to go into a crisis to be able to deal with your problems. So we'll see whether the league was in, you know, has, how it comes out of this, and and whether or not it can emerge stronger as it as it promises to do. Well, one can only hope that we're all playing football in 2023. Dave, I can't wait to have you back because I cannot imagine this is the last time we're going to talk some football, man. So thank you. Excellent, guys. Always fun. Take care.